All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Today, in this lecture, so last time we talked about the metabolism of various neurotransmitters. And today, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the effects of these neurotransmitters and signaling molecules, because we're not only going to be talking about what effects these signaling molecules have in the central nervous system, although that's going to be the main focus, but we'll also talk about what these substances, uh, what kind of effects they have in the periphery, um, so outside of the central nervous system. Um, before we go into the individual neurotransmitters, just a general principle or general warning, maybe. Um, with neurotransmitters, it's a little bit different from hormones and other types of signaling molecules. Because with hormones, we can generally say what happens if there is too much of a hormone or too little of a hormone, okay? So if there's too much of uh, T3, triadothyronine, we know that it's gonna produce hypermetabolism, et cetera, et cetera. If there's too little triadothyronine, it's gonna cause hypometabolism, et cetera, et cetera. With neurotransmitters, it doesn't really work like that. Because these neurotransmitters, when we speak about the central nervous system, they, they work as signaling molecules in very specific neural circuits. So in the brain, there are a lot of various circuits interconnected together. And these neural circuits, neural circuits use different neurotransmitters as their signaling molecules. In other, way, uh, in other words, uh, an increase of a neurotransmitter in a specific neural circuit may have a very different effect than an increase in a different neural circuit. So uh, the analogy that I, that I use, I'm not sure how helpful it is, but if you think about a computer chip, about a computer processor, it uses electricity, electric voltage and current, to do its computations. But it doesn't make any sense to say, well, if we add more electricity to the whole chip, it's gonna compute better or it's gonna do something, you know, it doesn't work like that because there are various different parts of the chip that do various functions of various computations. And if we increase the voltage or whatever, add more current into this part of the chip, it may start computing something faster or whatever. But if we do it elsewhere, it's gonna produce a completely different effect. And the same way it works with neurotransmitters. So it's very important where the increase or the decrease happens. And as we'll see today, at least with one system, um, just altering the amount of the neuro neurotransmitter can, can cause very different effects in different parts of the brain. Okay, so that's kind of the, the first general warning. We can't just say depression is caused by not enough serotonin in the brain. That's not true, okay? It, there may be some disruption of serotonin signaling, but it depends where it is, et cetera, et cetera. The other complication with neurotransmitters, and actually that's true for many other types of signaling molecules as well, is that most of the molecules we're gonna be talking about have more than one receptor, more than one receptor type. So, as we'll see, there are neurotransmitters that can cause excitation of the target cell, depolarization, spread of more signal contraction, or what have you. But the same neurotransmitter using a different receptor can actually cause the opposite. Inhibition, stopping of a contraction, or, or what have you, okay? So this is a further complication in understanding how neurotransmitters work, because you also have to know what kind of receptors there are in the target tissue to know what the increase or decrease in a neurotransmitter is going to cause in this, uh, in this target tissue. And again, I will highlight these things as we, as we go along with the, um, with the individual neurotransmitters, how we can have opposite or very different effects using the same neurotransmitter. Right. Um, what we can start with are the two major neurotransmitters in the central nervous system by number of neurons who use them, and those are? Glutamate and GABA. Glutamate and GABA are the number one, at least by abundance, the, the two number one neurotransmitters. So let's start with glutamate. Um, 
glutamateergic receptors can be divided into two groups. One group are ionotropic receptors, and the other group are metabotropic, yes. What, what does it mean when I say ionotropic receptor? What, what does it mean? Hmm? No, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, just somebody say, yeah. Um, what kind of iron channels are they? They're ligand-gated iron channels, very good. So that means they form an iron channel which opens in response to a ligand, in this case it would be, uh, it would be glutamate. So the ionotropic glutamatergic receptors are all cationic channels. They all, when they open, they allow cations to flow through. So what happens to the target membrane? What happens to the target uh, neuron when a cation, relatively non-selective cation channel opens? There's going to be depolarization. Why is there going to be depolarization? Okay, so the majority of ions are going to flow in, inside, positively charged. Why? Because there's... Very good. Are potassium ions going to flow in? No. Why not? It's at equilibrium. Okay, when we are at resting potential, we're close to the equilibrium potential. Yeah. Um, now, there are a few people who answer these questions correctly. Is this something that's clear to everybody? Yeah? Perfect. Good. I'm happy. All right. Um, so these ionotropic glutamatergic receptors are all cation, relatively non-specific cation channels. So their opening allows sodium and calcium ions to go in. Okay, that's the main effect. There might be some potassium flowing out, but let's not worry about that. Uh, and I want you to know three subtypes of these ionotropic glutamatergic receptors. Um, these three subtypes are called after their specific agonists, so their specific uh, the chemical substances that specifically affect only this, the subtypes. Okay, so all of them are opened by glutamate, but each has a specific substance which is synthetic or found in nature, which only interacts with the subtype. That's why we use these to call the subtypes. And we'll see that that's actually true for many other neurotransmitter, sub neurotransmitter receptor subtypes they're called by these other substances which are specific to. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, all right. So the three types that I, that I want you to know are called NMDA, which stands for N-methyl D-aspartate. And N-methyl D-aspartate is this specific substance that opens them. The other type are called AMPA, which stands for amino-methyl isoxazole propionic acid, which is the specific opener. You don't have to know that. You don't have to know that, All right? And third type are kinate receptors, which comes from kinic acid, uh, which is a substance found in nature, I think, in some kind of plankton, sea plankton or whatever. Uh, and this kinic acid opens only this specific subtype of kinate glutamatergic receptors. But all of them are opened by glutamate. Now, these three subtypes have their own individual specific characteristics. They open slightly differently, they open for a shorter or longer time, they have different conductivities, etc., etc. But what I want to talk about are the specific characteristics of the NMDA receptor, which, again, by number, is probably the most abundant receptor in the brain. Okay, so there's probably the largest number of NMDA than any other receptor. Um, any other receptor that we're going to be talking about. The interesting thing about the NMDA receptor, okay, so this is the place where glutamate would bind, and here's the channel, okay. The interesting thing about the NMDA receptor is that at normal membrane potential, at resting membrane potential, the channel is blocked by a magnesium ion. So the magnesium ion just sits in the channel, 
it is attracted, it is pulled down by the electric field force that we talked about, okay? So it wants to go in, but it's too big, it's too big. It can't go through the, through the channel, okay? So it blocks it, basically, all right? Even if glutamate binds to the receptor and wants to open it, the pore is still blocked by magnesium and therefore no ions can flow in. So in order to open the NMDA receptor, another event has to happen and that's depolarization. So the membrane, for the NMDA receptor to open, the membrane already has to be slightly depolarized so that the magnesium ion flows out because there's no more this pressure, this force that pulls it back into the cell. So it flows out and then it allows sodium and calcium ions to flow in. So this receptor is is unique, I would say, compared to all other, other receptors, in that in order for it to open, two things have to happen pretty much simultaneously. Glutamate has to bind, and the membrane has to depolarize, or has to be at least partly depolarized. With all the other receptors, only the binding of the ligand that opens them is sufficient for them to open, or start a cascade, but here two things have to happen. And this is quite important functionally, because the NMDA receptor itself works as what physicists would call coincidence detector. So it detects that two things happen at the same time. And this is quite important for information processing. Because when I said, when we, in the first lecture that we had about these things, I said that it's important not to imagine that a neuron is just a switch, an on-off switch, that it either you know, it takes a signal and sends it on or takes a signal and doesn't send it on. It's much more complicated because there are thousands of signals coming in and the neuron computes them and then decides whether it wants to send a signal and what kind of signal, etc. Here you can see that actually even at the level of one individual ion channel, one individual receptor, there is already some computation going on because only when two things happen at the same time, a depolarization is sent on, okay, or is created or whatever. Uh, so even at the level of individual protein molecules, there's already some kind of computation going on. And this coincidence detection is very important for learning. Okay, so when, when neurons or when our brains learn, they learn by detecting that certain signals come at the same time, or you know, there is, for example, a signal saying, uh, I am really scared, okay, this is a big simplification, okay, I'm really scared and I see something or whatever, I touched something hot or whatever, I don't know, I feel pain and I touch something, something hot. And these two things become associated and this is what learning is. We associate certain things together, all right? And this coincidence detection of an MDA receptor appears to be an important um, prerequisite for, for learning. Okay, so it's quite an interesting thing about the NMDA receptor. Uh, with the other two, you don't really need to know any other characteristics, although they tend to be quite important. Now, how does this depolarization come about that the NMDA receptor can open? Well, either there has to be some other input into the, into the neuron, okay? So at the same time, some other neuron has to fire, or there have to be some other receptors close by that cause this partial depolarization so that the NMDA receptor can open, okay? So there, are, there must be some other, other signals or some other reception of signals. All right, do you have any questions about these? No. The metabotropic glutamatergic receptors are denoted as M-GLUR, metabotropic glutamatergic receptors, and they are all G-protein coupled. There are actually quite a few different types. We won't go into the, the subtypes. Uh, but they're all G-protein coupled receptors. Now when we talk about G-protein coupled receptors, what is the, what is the normal cascade? What happens when a G-protein coupled receptor is activated? Hmm? Where? Okay. So GTP binds in, correct? And then what happens? Changes conformation, correct. 
Well, not quite. There are still a few steps, few more steps. So the receptor is activated. The G protein that adheres to it changes conformation, binds, a, uh, binds GTP, releases GDP in the alpha subunit. Yeah. Activation of the enzyme. Okay. So first, the G protein splits into the alpha subunit carrying the GTP activated alpha subunit and the beta gamma dimer. And we'll come today to the function of the beta gamma dimer, which also has an important function or many important functions. But anyway, okay, so the G protein splits. And then the alpha subunit and the beta gamma dimer as well activate some further proteins or influence the function of some of the proteins. And you know that there are several subtypes of the G-alpha subunit, which determine what kind of enzymes, what kind of target proteins they interfere with, right? Okay, we'll get to that today when we're going to talk about all, well, not all the different subtypes, many, many subtypes. And that determines, the subtype of the alpha subunit determines what kind of effect the activation of the G-protein coupled receptor is going to have on the cell. Okay, so not all G protein coupled receptors have the same effect. Some of them will stimulate it, some of them will inhibit it, etc. So anyway, uh, this is just a quick revision of G protein coupled receptors because we'll come to them. But here, let it be sufficient that uh, metabotropic, uh, uh, metabotropic glutamatergic receptors are G protein coupled receptors without really needing to know much more. Um, their function is, is both in the central nervous system, in the periphery as well. These metabotropic glutamatergic receptors are important in the retina, and we're going to talk about it uh, next year when we talk about the functioning of the retina and the perception of light. So we're going to mention these metabotropic receptors, which are there uh, because they mediate the communication between the uh, photoreceptors and the rest of the nervous system. Uh, and it appears that, that some metabotropic glutamatergic receptors are also important for the detection of the fifth taste. So in, has, have people heard about the umami. fifth taste? The umami, umami taste, which is basically the taste of amino acids and mostly glutamate. And some metabotropic glutamatergic receptors probably pl play some role in this detection. But again, as we'll see next year, there is a different receptor for glutamate, which is very, very important and probably more important than these ones, but these can also play a role there. All right. That's all for the receptors of glutamate. As you'll see, the majority of these, especially the inotropic, are excitatory. They will excite the target cell. Okay? They will depolarize it and cause contraction or cause uh, a further spread of the signal. With the metabotropic receptors, some of them are activating and some of them are deactivating. Some of them are inhibitory as well. Okay? So here it's a mixed bag. Therefore, normally we say glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. Well, mostly it is but there do exist inhibitory glutamatergic receptors as well. Okay, there are minority, uh, but as I said, we'll, we'll need them in the retina when we talk about the retina. There, there we need some, some inhibitory glutamatergic receptors. All right, let's move on to the counterweight, in a way, to glutamate, which is GABA. GABA, as far as we know, has two main receptors uh, or receptor subtypes. There might be a third one, but it's probably just a splice variant of one of them, so let's not worry about it too much. We have GABA A receptor and GABA B receptor. And they are very different. GABA A receptor is also an ionotropic receptor. But, GABA, and we said that GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So what kind of ion channel would be opened or what kind of ion channel should GABA A receptor be in order to cause inhibition of the target cell? Yes, indeed. It is a chloride channel, which is activated by GABA. And as it opens, chloride flows into the cell according to its concentration gradient and causes hyperpolarization of the cell, okay? The potential becomes more negative, and therefore, it makes it harder for the cell to be depolarized, okay? And tomorrow, when we talk about some of the 
medication, some of the drugs that bind to GABA-A channel, we'll see that opening this channel in the brain has very profound effects on how the central nervous system works and how we behave. All right. Uh, GABA-B receptor is a G-protein coupled receptor, which is coupled with GI, and also causes inhibition. So both of these receptors are inhibitory receptors. So GABA does not have any excitatory receptors. Okay, it's all inhibitory. All right, um, GI. What does GI do? Hmm? Okay, it decreases cyclic AMP, and how does it do that? Mm -hmm. It inhibits adenylate cyclase. Okay, that's the main effect. There are some other effects. There may be some direct effects on some ion channels, but the, the main effect is through adenylate cyclase, the inhibition of adenylate cyclase. All right. So now we've covered basically 99.9% .9 of all the receptors in the central nervous system. Okay. However, we still have plenty of time, so let's now have a look at all the other receptors because there are many, 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 many more, even though their numbers in the brain are, of course, much, much, much smaller. Um, these two, these two neuro neurotransmitters are not associated with any specific structures in the brain. They are just everywhere. Okay? There, there's no point talking about a glutamateergic part of the brain. They're just everywhere in the cortex, in the subcortical structures. They are just everywhere. All right, let's move on to some of the minor neuro neurotransmitters that have, of course, big functional importance, uh, but by numbers of neurons, they're much smaller. And there, I will mention some of the structures in the brain that use these neurotransmitters. And even though I know that most of you, or probably none of you, have done any neuroanatomy, so these structures will sound probably very strange and you won't have any good idea where they are. So don't worry about that. That's not something that I want you to take away from here, but maybe, you know, it will stay in, in your brain somewhere, which is kind of funny, but anyway, it will stay in your brain. Next year, when, we when you talk about uh, neuroanatomy, it will come back and you'll say, oh, yes, of course, I know this part because I already heard about it. All right, so now let's talk about adrenergic receptors. We're going to talk about receptors for adrenaline and noradrenaline. These can be divided into several different sub, several different subtypes. Usually they are divided into sort of two groups, historically, alpha and beta, but in fact there are in total five subtypes. So we have alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two, and beta three receptors. All these adrenergic receptors are G-protein coupled receptors. All of them are metabotropic. All of them are G-protein coupled. Okay, so that makes it relatively simple, hopefully. However, they are coupled with different G-proteins and therefore they will have different effects on the target cell. All these receptors, from alpha-1 to beta-3, all these receptors can be activated either by adrenaline or by noradrenaline. So both of, both of these molecules will bind to these, to these receptors and will activate them. However, the two molecules have differing affinities between the two main groups of, of receptors. So adrenaline has higher affinity to beta receptors and noradrenaline has higher affinity to alpha receptors. Okay, so if we if adrenaline or noradrenaline is released into, um, into an environment where all of these receptors are, noradrenaline will have a tendency to bind to alpha receptors more than beta, and adrenaline will bind more to beta receptors and, uh, than to alpha, but both of them will activate all of them. Yep, yeah. right. This again is something you should keep in your head because then later on, a little bit in the last lecture, but in later years, this will explain why adrenaline is given for some things and noradrenaline is given for some other things, okay? Because even though they all activate the same receptors, they have different affinities and they will have diff slightly different effects on these. All right. What kind of signaling cascades and what kind of effects these receptors have and also where are they? So the first three receptors 
can all be found in the central nervous system. Okay? But not only there. They, all are, also, they are also found in the periphery, so I'll, I'll explain that. Alpha-1 receptor is connected, is associated with the GQ protein. What is the cascade with GQ? Very good. So it activates phospholipase C. C. Very good. And, the, and what is the, uh, the reaction that phospholipase C catalyzes? It hydrolyzes. It hydrolyzes diacylglycerol? PIP2, which stands for? Phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate. Okay, phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate is hydrolyzed to diacylglycerol and inositol trisphosphate. Very good. Okay, and these two second messengers have their own effects. IP3 does what? Opens calcium channels where? In the endoplasmic reticulum, very good. Okay, so really releases calcium and causes all sorts of effects. And diacylglycerol. What? <laughs> Stays in the membrane, yeah, or associated with the membrane and activates. PKC, which stands for? Protein kinase C. Very good. All right, good. So this is the cascade of GQ. Uh, so this is what will happen when alpha-1 receptor is activated. If it is sitting on a neuronal membrane, it will cause depolarization or activation of exocytosis or whatever. It will activate the, the neuron. But as I said, alpha-1 receptors are not only in the brain, but they are also present in the periphery. And the, one of the important places or important tissues where alpha-1 receptor is expressed at high numbers are the smooth muscles of blood vessels. So it's alpha-1 receptor that is responsible for a large part of regulating the, the tone of, or the constriction of blood vessels in the body. Okay, so when alpha-1 is activated, GQ, etc., the IP3, the release of calcium, and that causes contraction of these smooth muscles, and therefore the increase of blood pressure. Okay, so alpha-1 receptors, apart from being in the brain, they also regulate blood, blood pressure. They increase their activation, increases blood pressure in the periphery. Does that make sense? And the cascade through calcium, smooth muscles, it's all clear. Good. Um, alpha-2 receptors are associated with a GI protein, and they are inhibitory. They will inhibit the target cell. The main function of alpha-2 receptors is as presynaptic receptors. So as adrenaline, noradrenaline is released into the synaptic cleft, the alpha-2 receptors convey the signal back to the presynaptic neuron and say, enough of adrenaline has been released. Stop releasing it. Okay, so there's a feedback mechanism by activating alpha-2 receptors saying, okay, that's been enough, okay, tone it down or stop releasing it. So activation of alpha-2 receptors will in fact, through a presynaptic way, will inhibit the release of adrenaline or adrenaline in the central nervous system. So the, the predominant place of alpha-2 receptor is actually in the central nervous system and works there as a presynaptic, uh, presynaptic receptor. Okay. Again, this will become important when we talk about some drugs that bind to it, because then we can influence the release of, of adrenaline or adrenaline in the central nervous system by activating these alpha-2 receptors. All right. All the beta receptors are, fortunately, associated with the same G protein. They are all associated with GS. And GS activates what kind of cascade? Mm -hmm. So it activates adenylate cyclase, increases CAMP production, and then activates protein kinase A. Right? And then does all sorts of things. It can phosphorylate ion channels. It can change gene, gene expression, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Um, 
Beta-1 receptors, as I said, are still in the central nervous system. They can be find, found in the central nervous system, but they are also in the periphery. And in the periphery, one of their important functions is that through beta-1 receptor, adrenaline and noradrenaline can increase heart rate and also the strength of cardiac of heart contraction. All right? So when there is a stress reaction where you have to, you know, fight or flight reaction, the thing that makes your heart pump harder and faster is mainly adrenaline or adrenaline through beta-1 receptors, okay? So again, that's something that we can then therapeutically use. If we want to increase heart rate, we're gonna use stuff that activates these receptors, and if we want to decrease heart rate, we're gonna use chemicals that inactivate or block this, this receptor. We'll see that in the, in the last lecture in this mini, uh, mini block. All right, so that's the, sp that's the special thing about beta-1 receptors. Beta-2 receptors are found in uh, smooth muscles, also in blood vessels, but also in the bronchial tree, so in the bronchi, in the lungs, okay? So we have trachea, which then splits into bronchi, and then bronchioles, etc., etc. and all these have walls that are made of smooth muscles. And similar to blood vessels, we can constrict them or, or dilate them, and we can regulate how much air we get in our, in our lungs, all right? Now, if there is a stress reaction, we want to fight or flight, whatever, um, what should we do with, what, sh what would be logical to do with the bronchial tree? to dilate it so that we get as much air as, as we can. And this is ex exactly what happens. So adrenaline is released, noradrenaline to some extent as well, and through beta-2 receptors, it will dilate the bronchial tree so that we can get as much air in our lungs so that we can fight or run, run away or some, something like that, all right? Now I said that some blood cells or that beta-2 receptor is also present in the smooth muscle of blood cells. And there it also mediates relaxation or vasodilation. So it's, it actually works directly against the alpha-1 receptor with which we said it causes vasoconstriction, right? But beta-2 causes actually vasodilation. What is the logic behind it? Well, the logic is, if we once again use the stress reaction as a modal reaction, in the stress reaction, we want some blood vessels in some organs or some tissues to constrict because we don't need them for the stress reaction, and where would that be? In the stress reaction, which parts of the body do we not need to be as well perfused as? The stomach, the stomach urinary tract, skin, okay? That's why people in stress, you know, are very pale, because the, the blood vessels in the skin will constrict, because we don't need a lot of blood there. On the other hand, there are organs which need a lot of blood in this, in this case, which would be? The heart, the brain to some extent, and, and, and skeletal muscle, right? Because those are the, the, the places where we need a lot of blood in order to do whatever we need to do. So in these blood vessels, the majority of adrenergic receptors are gonna be beta-2 receptors, while in those tissues where, which, where we don't need huge perfusion, the majority of receptors are gonna be alpha-1 receptors. And then we need just one signal, adrenaline or adrenaline, stress signal, to produce these very different effects on very different tissues, just depending on what kind of receptor is predominantly expressed there, okay? So this is an illustration when I said that the effect of a signaling molecule depends on what kind of receptors are expressed in the, in the target tissue. Well, this is, the, this is the illustration of that, okay? So one signal, let's say adrenaline, will have very different effects on our skin blood vessels and very different effects on skeletal muscle blood vessels, all right? Even though it's the same molecule. Good. Uh, beta-3 receptors uh, have been found relatively recently, and they are found in the adipose tissue, in fat. And they are responsible for initiating lipolysis, okay? Uh, what is the enzyme that catalyzes lipolysis in the adipose tissue? It's called hormone-sensitive lipase, and the hormone to which it is sensitive primarily is adrenaline through beta-3 receptors. There are some other hormones that can 
do similar things, but Okay, so beta 3, adipose tissue, and it's responsible for lipolysis. It's not really found, or definitely not in huge numbers in the central nervous system. All right, uh, those are all the adrenergic receptors, and again, it will come handy when we talk about the various medications that we can, tar that we can use to target these. Um, but I said that I would mention a little bit about where in the brain we can find neurons that actually use adrenaline or adrenaline. Well, uh, the main function, or one of the main functions of this adrenergic system in the brain is to keep us awake. Um, so it's part of a system which is called the reticular ascending activating system. Again, something that you will hear about much more next year. But it's a system, very old evolutionary system, which by using adrenaline and noradrenaline activates the brain so that we can keep perceiving things, etc. When it is damaged, people fall into coma from which it's very difficult to, to wake them up or impossible to wake them up. Uh, the adrenergic system is also plays a role in keeping our mood, so it's also kind of energizing our mood, and when there are defects, it may cause or it may play a role in the development of depression. Uh, the, uh, the adrenergic neurons are only present in a few very, very small groups of neurons, which are called nuclei. So in the brain, when there is a group of neurons together, which we can either under microscope or macroscopically see as a group of neuronal bodies, we call them nuclei. That's a general name, okay? So there's a nucleus, whatever, all sorts of different names, it means that it's a group of neurons, okay? So the nuclei that use uh, uh, adrenaline, noradrenaline, that produce adrenaline, noradrenaline, the main one is called locus ceruleus. which stands for, anybody, Latin? It stands for blue place, a blue little place. Locus means place, and Cerulaeus means uh, kind of sky blue. They have very diff many different names for blue colors, so it's kind of sky blue. Um, why is it called that way? Well, it's actually a tiny, let me try and... So it, this is sort of the brain, okay? So we have the hemispheres here. This is the cerebellum, okay? Here is the midbrain or the yeah, mesencephalon, and here is the basically the spinal cord. It goes into the spinal cord, okay? Medulla oblongata and spinal cord, just very briefly. So. Locus cerulose is present somewhere here, and it's literally a tiny group of neurons. It's about half a centimeter by half a centimeter, and that's where the majority of adrenergic neurons in the brain are. And it's called a blue place because, in fact, it's blue. It has blue color. So you'll see that next year when you look at brains, you will see that at the bottom of the fourth cerebral chamber, there are two little dots, blue dots, and that's locus cerulose, okay? And from there, the neurons, I can actually draw it in blue. From there, the neurons spread into, or the axons of these neurons spread into the whole brain and activate it, keep it awake, et cetera, et cetera, all right? Now the RAS, the, uh, the reticular ascending activating uh, system, has some other nuclei around it, but we don't need to go into, into details. Yeah? So if one of these two blue dots are malfunctioning chemicals, the sort of uh, problems with the person's cognitive ability? Uh, it will probably cause inconsciousness and, and coma. But alone, that almost doesn't happen. Okay, it's such a small group of neurons that it's almost impossible just like specifically disrupt it. You would have actually have to do it on purpose, which of course in humans doesn't really happen. But in experiment with, with animals, you, you can probably do that. Okay. All right. 
Any questions about the adrenergic system? No questions? All right. So in that case, let's have a, yes? What, what did you explain that uh, comes out of this locus? The axons. So the, the nerve bodies are in the nucleus. That's what a nucleus is. It's just a group of, of nerve bodies. But the axons spread out everywhere into the brain, into all sorts of other parts, into the thalamus, etc., etc. which are all adrenergic. So they secrete, okay, in the nerve terminal, they secrete adrenaline or adrenaline. All right, any other questions? No? Okay, let's take a four minute break. And we'll continue after that. Are there any questions to what we covered so far? Questions? No? Good. So we'll move on to the next catecholamine. So we covered adrenaline or adrenaline, so we'll now talk about the third catecholamine, which is dopamine. Now, dopamine receptors are denoted using the letter D, so there's nothing fancy about that. And we have about, Sorry, I'll just shut the door. And we have about five or six different subtypes uh, that have been so far found. However, for now, we'll just talk about the first two subtypes, so D1 and D2 receptors. All dopaminergic receptors are connected to a G protein. So they are all metabotropic G protein coupled receptors, okay? Which again makes it relatively easy, all G protein coupled. The G proteins to which they are coupled or the alpha subunits are GS and GI. And here I just want to say, because I had a question during the break, which I think might be a question that all of you have or many of you have. Um, the question was, well, how come that beta-2 receptor relaxes smooth muscles when it is connected to a GS protein, which is stimulatory, right? So it should be stimulated. Now, the GS, or, or the S in GS, stands for stimulation, but stimulation of adenylate cyclase. So it stimulates adenylate cyclase while GI inhibits adenylate, adenylate cyclase. But that does not necessarily mean that it stimulates the cell as a whole, okay? Because an, an increase in CAMP and the activation of PKA may have different effects in different cells depending on the context. So in some cells, there may be phosphorylation of potassium channels and it can cause hyperpolarization, or there can be phosphorylation of some other protein, calcium channels, and may cause depolarization. So the fact that there's a GS protein does not necessarily mean that the cell as a whole will be stimulated to contraction or action potential or what have you, okay? Just so you know, so that you don't get confused, how is it possible that, that a, GS protein, uh, a GS protein coupled receptor actually inhibits the cell or causes relaxation, okay? All right, so here we have a, a GS protein and GI protein, and here it actually follows what we would expect, at least in most cells. So the D1 receptors generally tend to be excitatory, or the activation excites the cells, while GI generally tend to be inhibitory, okay? Um, I'll get to why I want you to know these two receptors, really, or especially the D2 in a second. But before we get there, I want to talk about where in the brain dopaminergic neurons are. And here I think it will be the clearest, hopefully, how very different effects of one neurotransmitter can we have depending on which circuit we look at, okay? So in the brain there are in total, or at least the main ones, are four neuronal circuits or neuronal pathways that use dopamine as its signaling molecule. That means there are four, let's say, four pathways in which axons 
from neurons use dopamine as their signaling molecule. Is that clear? Yeah. All right. And I want to talk about all four of them, even though now many of the structures that I will be talking about will make absolutely no sense to you, okay? Because you haven't really done any neuroatomy. But it's important to see, I think at this point, it's important to see how very different these neuronal circuits, how very different effects they have. So the first pathway is called mesocortical. Mesocortical. And it always is denoted by where the pathway starts, so where the neurons are, and where the axons go. So meso, it means the mesencephalon, and I'll use a different color. So we have, this is not a very good drawing, and I think if an anatomist saw it, they would be just horrified, but um, the neurons that are at the start of the mesocortical pathway are somewhere around here, okay, in the mesencephalon, and they project into the cortex into the brain cortex. So that's why the pathway is called mesocortical. The structure from which they start is called the VTA, or ventral tegmental area. They're horrible names in neuroanatomy, and if you think that biochemistry is difficult with all sorts of different names that are just incomprehensible, just wait for anatomy, okay? It's much worse. Uh, so the ventral tegmental area is a very small part of the brain, okay, again, maybe centimeter by centimeter or not even that, from which or where the dopaminergic neurons sit and they project into the cortex and influence the functioning of the cortex. Once again, we're talking about a very small number, just a few thousand, maybe a few tens of thousands of neurons, which in the end have a profound effect on the functioning because they fine tune the functioning of the, of the whole cortex. The, the main projections from the, in this pathway are into the frontal lobes, into the frontal lobes. And the frontal lobes are responsible, among um, other things, for what we call thinking, okay? Planning our thoughts, uh, you know, doing abstract computations or what have you, okay? So this is what frontal lobes are for. The function of this mesocortical pathway appears to be to fine tune our let's say, signal processing. As you sit here or as you do whatever, our brains through the eyes, ears, etc., receive terabytes of data, H huge amounts of data all the, all the time, okay? In order for us not to go insane, we have to filter the majority of all this information out, okay? Some of you may be filtering out what I'm doing on the board, but hopefully, most of you are filtering out what's happening outside, that there's a picture on the wall, uh, that there are some jackets there, that whatever, there is a red chalk lying on the, um, on the table. That's something you see, it's going into the retina, you all see it, but the brain, hopefully, uh, doesn't pay a lot of attention to these things, okay? And this is something which, according to hypotheses of neurobiologists, and there's some data for it, is fine-tuned, at least partly, by this mesocortical pathway. If something goes wrong in this pathway, then we can start paying a lot of attention to things that probably do not deserve our attention, and that can cause big problems. So imagine that you are going to school in the morning to, you know, to lecture, and you see a, a car is you know, just, just passing, uh, passing you, and you see that the registration plate, uh, whatever, has three and seven in it, okay? And that's, again, something that probably happens to all of us every day a hundred times that something like this happens, but we just don't pay any attention. But then if there's some disruption in this pathway, some people may think, well, wait, you know, I was born on the 3rd of July, maybe it's trying to, you know, maybe it's something important, you know, maybe there's something behind it, maybe this person who drove the car, that it wasn't just a random accident, maybe there's some connection, okay? And again, this is something what the system is supposed to do, okay? It's telling us, okay, this is important, pay attention to this, and this is not important, so don't pay attention to that. But if it becomes dysregulated, then uh, it can cause problems. And this mesocortical pathway is, is implicated or has been implicated for many years in the development or its disruption 
in the development of schizophrenia, of psychotic mm, disorders. All right. Uh, sorry? Um, not directly, anyway. Okay. It's it's a very different thing. It's not so much. Uh, yeah, I don't want to go into, into OCD. It's a, ver it's a very different disorder, okay? Here it's really about thinking, okay? About how we perceive the world. Yep? So people with a very um, well-functioning mesocortical area in the brain, do they have photosodic memories? No, 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 no. It has actually very little to do with memory, okay? Memory is a completely different thing. This is just about to what, to what we pay attention and to what we leave out, okay? It's impossible to pay attention to everything. It's just... It's impossible, okay? We always have to filter out 99.999% of all the information that comes in, okay? It's really a question about how we select the things to which we pay attention and to which we don't, okay? Now, all these things that I'm telling you are a massive simplification of what goes on, okay? So by the time you get to, um, uh, to psychiatry in the fourth or fifth year, the theories that they will tell you will become much more fleshed out and there are a lot of other details. This is just like a very brief introduction of why these pathways are, are important and how we can, which we'll talk about in the last lecture in this mini block, how we can influence them at least a little bit, okay? So take this as a, a huge simplification of what actually goes on, okay? You'll hear more about it later on. So that's the mesocortical pathway. Uh, the other pathway, which also is very, very, very important functionally and even clinically, et cetera. It's called the mesolimbic pathway. Once again, mesolimbic. It also starts in the VTA, in the ventral tegmental area. But this time it doesn't go to the cortex, but it goes into a much older structure of the brain, evolutionary in an evolutionary way, older structure, which is called the limbic system. And the limbic system is a collection of structures very deep inside the end brain, so this big part of the brain, it's hidden inside. So there are some nuclei here, and there's the, here's singly, etc. There are some structures there, okay? So that's the limbic system. And this pathway, this mesolimbic pathway, which color have I used? Green. Starts in the VTA and projects into these old structures in the limbic system. Uh, limbic system contains structures like nucleus accumbens, amygdala, etc., etc. Again, things that you will learn about later on. Uh, the limbic system, you may have heard about the limbic system. Does anyone know what functions it, yeah, it has? With what? With uh, the functioning and the skills and memory, uh, uh, memories formed in one day. It does influence formations of memories, but not directly. It's not where memory is, is actually stored. It does influence memory, but it influences it mainly through emotions. Okay, so the limbic system, again, it's a massive simplification. There are all sorts of other systems that play a role, but the limbic system is generally associated with us processing and developing emotions, okay? Once again, a very important function because it allows us to live in this world. Even our thinking is influenced by emotions, and of course, a lot of learning is influenced by emotions as well. Hence, the, uh, the connection with memories, because memories that are associated with an emotional thing are much stronger uh, than memories without an, uh, any kind of emotion. Now, um, in order, I don't really want to go into too many details in the limbic system, but this, this mesolimbic pathway is a part of what neurobiologists call a reward system. So it's a system in the brain uh, that rewards us for things that evolution deemed important for us to do, all right? So if we eat, and especially if we eat something good, the reward system sends signals through dopamine into mainly nucleus accumbens and makes us feel good because we did something that is good for us. Now, of course, in nowadays affluent society, eating may not be the best thing you can do, but you can imagine that from an evolutionary perspective, it made us do certain things, okay? This pathway, of course, is activated during sex, okay? Again, something that the evolution made us 
do because it's, it's a good thing. It makes us feel good, all right? So this is a system that is activated in all these kind of activities that have developed to make us feel good or rather that evolution made sure that we do because it made, uh, they make us feel good. Nowadays, there are studies where people show that, um, using imaging studies, that for example, Facebook notifications activate this pathway, okay? It makes, us, it makes us feel like people are interested in us because you know, the, the stuff is happening. Now, that may sound funny, but that's not an accident. That is very, uh, th there is a specific reason why Facebook developed these ways the way they developed them because they know that it will make us want to do these things more and more and more, okay? So that's, per that's absolutely on purpose. They are actually designing, and it's not just Facebook, there are of course advertisements on TV, etc. They are all aiming for our reward system to activate it and to make us do what they want, okay? And with Facebook, there are actually a lot of studies which show that that's ex exactly what's happening, all right? So they are manipulating our very old, evolutionary, very old systems in order to make money. So uh, that's the, uh, the Mesolympic pathway. It's all, of course, also implicated in uh, the development of addiction, substance addiction, but not just substance addiction, but also gambling addiction, etc. But I just want to say here that the concept of addiction is way, way, way more complex than just an activation of the reward system, okay? There are some people who just say, well, whatever activates the reward system will cause addiction. But that's clearly not true, because even with substance addiction, even with cocaine or what have you, um, the, um, it depends on many other factors whether a person will become addicted and also what it means to be addicted, okay? It means that you stop functioning in normal society, you have some issues, because there are, and I wouldn't go too long about that, but there are casual users of heroin, for example. There are people who live normal middle class, often women, um, who take heroin you know, every other day or something like that, but they go to work and they function perfectly normally. Are they addicted? Well, I don't know. Uh, anyway, so the, the, the addiction as a whole has much more uh, to do with societal factors, much more to do whether uh, a person has a, um, uh, a social network, meaning the real social network, so with actual people, um, whether they have any um, plans for the future or whether they actually believe that there is something for them in the future. So it's a very socially determined thing, okay? Uh, oftentimes the people who become addicted are poor people or people who do not have any perspective, who do not have any you know, possibility to improve themselves and they can become addicted while people who are actually living quite you know, um, rich lives, both materially and, and socially, are much less likely to become addicted. So I'm just trying to show you, and again, this is not an explanation of what addiction is. You'll hear about it or you can read about it much more. It's a very complicated thing. Mesolimbic system is important there probably or is involved, but it's definitely not the only thing. So it's not a neurobiological thing. It's a much more complicated thing, addiction. May I ask you yes. Is there like a similar pathway, but with the serotonin? Because I've heard about this like the serotonin reward system because like right. someone told me that like it's only like the serotonin which plays like a huge role in the yeah it it doesn't i mean the, there are serotonin system serotonin system we'll look at them uh, but they're not really involved in the reward system okay um yeah we can come to them maybe in the, in the break, but, but not, not directly, okay? It's, it's possible that some serotonergic system can activate the reward system, that's possible, and plenty of them do. For example, opioid systems will activate the reward system, or nicotine will activate the reward system indirectly, okay? But, but directly, this is all dop dopaminergic. Not, not really, not directly, but it also depends what kind of substance it is because some substances can be directly toxic, directly neurotoxic, some synthetic drugs, uh, but most of them do not have any neurotoxic effects. Okay, so they will not damage the brain. They will change it, of course, the same way any experience changes people. It will change the brain, uh, but not really damage, no. All right, um, let's go through. We still have two more dopaminergic systems and then some other ones. Um, the next dopaminergic system is called nigrostriatal. 
and it's called that because it starts in a little group of neurons called substantia nigra or black substance and again that's not random because as you'll see when you see uh, cross sections of the brain especially of the of the middle part of the brain uh, you will see again a little circle which is black and that's called substantia nigra um, so we are somewhere here ish uh, and these pigmented cells in substantia nigra, they use dopamine and they project once again somewhere around here, deep inside the brain, into structures called the basal ganglia. So this is not quite related to the, um, well, there's some connection with the limbic system, but not directly, but we're in the same area, deep, deep, deep inside the brain, below the cortex. And these basal ganglia are very important for our movement. So they are the place that computes how we move around so that we don't fall over when we start walking. Okay, so they integrate a lot of information from the periphery, from the cerebellum, uh, from uh, uh, the equilibrium organs that tell us how we're doing. Okay, and this pretty big connection, a collection of neurons then computes how we can actually move around, okay? Once again, that's a pretty complex problem. Maybe you've seen on, on YouTube these robots that try to walk the stairs, okay? And it's, it's a difficult problem, okay? It's very clear that most of these robots are just unable to do it or, you know, when something happens, they just fall over because they can't figure it out. So these basal ganglia, really big, chunky parts of brain, are responsible for doing all this, okay? And this projection from substantia nigra fine-tunes our ability especially to initiate movement. So from standstill to start moving, for this, this projection is quite important. And let me just say that this projection is damaged in Parkinson's disease. So in Parkinson's disease, one of the main symptom symptoms is really the inability to initiate movement. So these people, are really, it's difficult for them to move around. They're very slow. Oftentimes their mimic muscles are, are not really moving very much, okay? And it's not because they're paralyzed or something like that. It's because this computation in the basal ganglia is, is, is not as efficient, is not as good, uh, because this pathway is, is, is damaged. Yes? There's melatonin? Well, I think so. That's in the pineal yeah, gland. Sorry, no, 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 no. Well, melanin is the black stuff, but melanin in substantia nigra is not used for signaling. It's just inside the neurons. You really don't need to know that. <laughs> Re I mean, if you really want to, it's in the pars compacta, but like, we're talking about about this size of the part of the brain. And yes, it has two parts, I agree with that, but I don't think you really need to know which part it, it ori originates from, okay? Uh, this is just a very first information, all right? Okay, and the final pathway uh, is called the tubero infundibular. And in connection with what did he tell you about the pars compacta and pars reticularis? I think he just said that there is melanin, that's it. Okay, it talked that's about melanin. Yeah. All right. Yeah, but that's, that's just what makes it black. I think it okay. Of course, or maybe in his picture. Sure. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. That just makes it black. It has nothing to do with the signaling at all. The tubero infundibular system is actually found in the hypothalamus, which is if we take this whole big brain, then underneath it is a little part of the brain called the hypothalamus, and from it comes the gland called the pituitary gland, right? So that's, <laughs> that's connected to it. So I'll try to draw it. Okay, so it'll be somewhere here. And there's a little group of neurons that produce dopamine and that project into the pituitary. And since you already talked about the pituitary gland, you know that all the, well, in the anterior part, that all the hormones 
or the secretion is regulated by factors coming from the hypothalamus, right? Liberating or releasing factors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, there's one hormone which whose release is inhibited by dopamine. Does anyone remember? It's prolactin, okay? So there's the prolactin inhibitory hormone, which is just dopamine, which comes from the hypothalamus. And it is this tubero infundibular pathway which inhibits the secretion of prolactin. So we have four pathways. And once again, going to what I said in the coming back to, to what I said in the beginning, we can't say an increase of a neurotransmitter will do this because it depends where, okay? So an increase in dopamine in the mesocortical pathway will cause problems with thinking. Uh, a, an increase in the mesolimbic pathway will provide reward, okay? Good feeling. An increase in the microstriatal pathway will probably disrupt our movements. Uh, an increase in the tubero infundibular pathway will inhibit the secretion of prolactin. Okay? Completely different effects of one signaling molecule in different uh, circuits. We'll talk about these a little bit at the, in the last lecture and we'll talk about them even more next year when we talk about some treatments of uh, psychiatric disorders. Yes? All the systems in the brain are interconnected. Everything is connected pretty much with everything. Okay? So yes, of course, they are somehow interconnected and they will communicate through many other systems elsewhere. They will, in the end, communicate with each other. It's all interconnected. Okay, any more questions, dopamine? Nope, all right. So we'll move to serotonin. Uh, we mentioned that the abbreviation for serotonin is 5-HT, so we're always going to use 5-HT, not S, that's not used anymore. Once again, there are about six or seven different subtypes of serotonergic, serotonergic receptors. We'll talk about three of them. 5-HT1, 5-HT2, and 5-HT3. Now, here is the big exception, because most of the time we said all the receptors are G-protein coupled. Well, here is the exception, because 5-HT3 receptors are actually ionotropic. So they are a cationic channel. Hence, excitatory, because if it's cationic channel, it will excite the cells. 5-HT3 receptors are very important for signaling when something is wrong with the composition of the blood, when there are some substances that our body recognizes as toxic, there's a pathway which uses, in part, 5-HT3 receptors to cause what is called central vomiting. Central vomiting, that means that it's mediated, that it's regulated by a central mechanism. Because, of course, if you put a finger up your throat, that's not a central vomiting. That's actually just a reflex ring which goes through the, the spinal cord and starts vomiting. Here it's a bit different. There is, somewhere around here, there's a little sensor in the brain, which monitors what is the comp how the composition of the blood changes. And when it de detects some weird things, it will start central vomiting. And the 5-HT3 uh, channels are involved in that. Uh, that's why there are drugs that block these 5-HT3 receptors and block this kind of vomiting. And they are mostly used in treating the vomiting caused by um, uh, anti-cancer therapy. Okay, so a lot of the anti-cancer drugs are very, very toxic to the body. That's, and we, we'll talk about them in, I don't know, in a month's time or something like that. Um, so it's very toxic and it causes this really intractable, continuous vomiting, which is obviously not only unpleasant, but it can actually cause real health problems because the people after cytotoxic therapy cannot eat, etc. So we can use blockers of 5-HT3 receptors to stop this vomiting and therefore, we can use much higher doses of cytotoxic therapy, et cetera. But we'll talk about that in, in a later lecture. Yes? Uh, 
Not really, no. They can cause vomiting or? Mm, I'm not sure. It's possible, but I'm not sure that there's a connection there. Yep. Can you repeat where uh, these are supposed to be? Well, they are in a circuit which I can't really draw where in the brain it is because it's a very tiny, it's a, it's a small circuit. But it's in the brain. It's in the brain. It's in the brain. Yes, it's a central thing. Actually, the majority of serotonergic receptor, uh, serotonergic nuclei are somewhere around here. They are called nuclei raphe, and they are somewhere around there. Let's not worry about them too much. Uh, now, going back by these to these receptors, uh, the 5-HT1, which is connected to a GI, and this is GQ, if I'm not, yes. This is with GQ, so the, these two are G-protein coupled receptors. With 5-HT1, it's a receptor that is needed for all sorts of communications in the brain. I won't tell you anything interesting about it. But the interesting thing about 5-HT2 receptors, one is that 5-HT2 receptors can be divided into at least four subtypes. So we have 5-HT2A, 5-HT2B, 5-HT2C, and 5-HT2D. Horrible, I know. But what I, what I want to mention is that 5-HT2A receptors are the receptors through which the majority of psychedelics of hallucinogens act. Okay, so all the substances like LSD, mescaline, uh, psilocybin, uh, and some other ones, some synthetic ones, all act through 5-HT2A receptor, okay? And they cause these vivid, colorful uh, hallucinations, uh, and it's all through this one, uh, this one receptor, which is quite interesting. What is the function of this receptor in the brain? Well, it's still a little bit unclear, but it appears, especially through the action of the psychedelics, it appears that it influences our visual, mainly visual perceptions of the, uh, of the world. And when we start distorting it, we see distorted things. Uh, so just so you know, 5-HT2A receptor is kind of important for uh, both psychopharmacology and other things. Serotonin is also connected with the regulation of mood and Tomorrow, in the last lecture in this mini blog, we'll talk very, very briefly about depression and how depression is treated. And one of the still quite influential theories of depression is connected to serotonin and to disruption of serotonin signaling. But I'll, tomorrow I'll mention a little bit more about that. All right. We're coming to the end, don't worry. Uh, but there are still a couple of things that, a couple of uh, neurotransmitters or signal markers that I want to talk about. Uh, the next one I want to mention is histamine. And when we talked about histamine metabolism, we said that in the brain, it's not, it's a super minor neurotransmitter. However, it has at least three receptors, three receptor subtypes. The H1, they are all G protein coupled. all three different types. Um, what are their functions? Well, I'll start from the end. The H3 receptor, and I just put it in brackets because it, it, it was only discovered quite recently and it's not super well studied, but it appears that the H3 receptor is a presynaptic, a negative feedback receptor. Remember when we talked about alpha-2 receptor, that it's a presynaptic negative feedback one? It appears that H3 receptor is a similar thing, okay? So it's a presynaptic uh, feedback. The H2 receptor is quite important in the periphery because it is a receptor through which the secretion of gastric acid is regulated. Okay, so the activation of this receptor will increase the production of acid in the, in the, um, in the stomach. And this, of course, is important pharmacologically because we can block these H2 receptors and we can stop the production of uh, of acid or decrease the production of acid. And this used to be the main way for treating gastric ulcers. Nowadays, we have completely different ways for doing that, um, but this is what was done at, at relatively recently. The H1 receptors are primarily in the brain. 
but also can be found on immune cells. And actually it's the H1 receptors which mediate the typical allergic reaction. So all those hay fevers and all these allergies, pollen allergies, etc. A lot of the reaction, the sneezing, etc., uh, are mediated by H1 receptors. So we can also have drugs that block these receptors, and those are all the antihistamines that many people take. Or yeah, so they are they act through H1. In the brain, the H1 receptors are responsible for regulating uh, sleep. Okay, so uh, their blocking, their blockage will actually put people into sleep. Um, and they also play a role in regulation of food intake, of appetite and food intake. So. That's very briefly about histamine, which, as I said, is such a minor neurotransmitter that, yeah, it's very poorly studied. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, these receptors are related to putting people to sleep, right? Well, the H1 receptor, yes. When you block it, it will make people sleep. Um, not so much for, well, you could probably influence them in either way to cause food intake suppression, but it's not really used clinically. Okay, because I knew that most of appetite suppressants are like, give you usually the opposite uh, reaction. They, they make oh, that they stimulate you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but again, we're talking about different circuits, okay? The only connection there is that actually you can use antihistamines as hypnotics. And in the US, for example, the majority of hypnotics that you can just buy over the counter without a prescription are actually antihistamines. Okay? So that's just an interesting connection of these, of these two things. All right, let's move on to uh, acetylcholine. And acetylcholine has two main groups of receptors. First group are, all co are called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Nicotinic, they're called so because nicotine activates them. And they are all ion channels. They're all cation channels. So they're ionotropic receptors. Okay, all ionotropic receptors. There are several different subtypes, uh, but all you need to know is that they're ionotropic. Then we have the other group, so these are called nicotinic. The other group are called muscarinic because they are activated by a substance called muscarine, which is from mushrooms, from toadstools. Okay. And they are denoted M, M1, M2, to all the way to M5 or 6. And they are all metabotropic, they are all G-protein coupled. So two very, very distinct, very different groups of receptors, but they are all receptors for acetylcholine. The nicotinic receptors are, for example, found in the neuromuscular junction. Okay, so all neuromuscular junctions have nicotinic receptors. They can also be found in autonomous, have you heard about the autonomous nervous system? Yeah, yeah? What, what is it? Sorry, that it? Okay, so it regulates a lot of involuntary functions. Okay, it regulates blood pressure, heart rate, uh, yeah, movement of the gut, etc., etc., secretion of various glands. And we have sympathetic and parasympathetic part of the autonomous nervous system. Now, in both both of these parts, there is always one interconnection between the first neuron and the second neuron. Again, something that you will hear much more next year. Um, but in this interconnection between the first neuron and the second neuron, we also use nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. No matter which part of the autonomous nervous system there is, the interconnections use nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. The muscarinic ones, again, there are at least five or six types, uh, but what I want to talk about are the first three. The M1 receptors are found mainly on neurons, so they are neuronal receptors, okay? And as you can see, they're connected with GQ, so that makes them excitatory. They will excite the next neuron through the pathway that, he set, that we set. Uh, 
M2 receptors can also be found in the brain, but they are very important in the heart because it's through M2 receptors that we can decrease heart rate. Okay, so we talked that we can increase, we talked about that we can increase heart rate by activating which receptor? Beta 1, okay, beta 1. And through M2, we can decrease the heart rate. And what is interesting here is that the decrease in heart rate is actually mediated by the beta gamma dimer. So remember, when we talked about the G protein cascade, we talked about the alpha subunit that goes on to activate or deactivate acetylate, adenylate cyclase and what have you. But here it's actually the beta gamma subunit that goes and activates potassium channels, it opens potassium channels, which hyperpolarizes the cell and therefore decreases the, the heart rate. Okay, it makes it harder for the, for the cells to depolarize and to, um, yeah, to conduct, all right? And M3 is present mostly in various glands, in various exocrine glands, like sweat glands or uh, yeah, salivary glands, tear glands, etc. Okay, and it's GQ, so it activates, activates these glands. This will become much clearer when you talk about the autonomous nervous system and the parasympathetic, what kind of things are activated by parasympathetic nervous system, and you'll see that it's mostly done through um, muscarinic receptors. All right, there are only two other neurotransmitter systems that we didn't cover, but we'll cover them now because they are very simple. The opioid system uses three different kind of receptors. They are denoted, to make it more difficult, they are denoted by Greek letters, mu, kappa, and delta. And they are all connected to GI proteins, and they are all inhibitory. Okay, so three different receptors. And these are all activated by endogenous opioids, but of course they are also activated by exogenous opioids such as morphine, heroin, fentanyl, and all these uh, oxycontin. Or whatever. And the last one you already heard about, which is nitric oxide. What is the receptor for nitric oxide? Soluble guanylate cyclase is the receptor for nitric oxide. Okay, so when nitric oxide is produced, there is intracellular receptor, which is the soluble guanylate cyclase, which produces CGMP from GTP, and then the further cascade from that. That was a question. Sorry? It's soluble guanylate cyclase. Okay, guanylate cyclase like adenylate cyclase, only it cyclizes. GTP to CGMP, and it's soluble, it's not associated with any, it's not a membrane protein, it's actually dissolved, or dissolved, it's not dissolved, but it just hangs around in the cytosol. All right. Okay. So this is a overview of various receptors of neurotransmitters. I know it's quite a lot of stuff, but in the last lecture, hopefully, it will come together and will allow you to understand how we can modify all these things. All right, um, we'll have another lecture together after the, after the half an hour break now. Um, but that will mostly be about thinking and not so much about new facts. So hopefully, it will be all right.